If you're joining us today online, thank you for being a part of our service today. And uh, we are, like I said, going to be talking over the next several weeks about how you can get plugged in. Um, today I want to talk to you about this thought, the heart behind serving. There has to be a heart behind serving. Now, I'll say this by way of introduction. There is no allowance, if you will, for the believer to sit on the sidelines. There is no such thing as an undercover Christian in Scripture. There is no such thing as halfway Christian. Oh, there are people that were, and there are things that describe Christians that were not fully committed, but that's not God's plan for your life. God is looking for people that get plugged in. He's not looking for perfect people. There are none of those. But he is looking for people that are willing to serve, willing to follow him, and willing to make a difference. Well, today uh, we're going to be looking at three stories. Actually, we're going to focus on two stories uh, from the Gospel of Mark chapter 7. Now, I'm not going to read the entire chapter for sake of time, but let me just describe the stories to you. The first story it's what I call the, the problem, the trouble with unwashed hands. Now, I don't know how you are. Most ladies probably really are like nice, nasty. You know, when you're growing up, you kept your hands washed. Most boys do not do that, okay? I know that it was often when I was, uh, as a teenager especially, um, I, nobody had any time to wash hands, Right? Uh, when I was 17 years old, uh, I went on a mission trip, and I went with a group of men uh, down into central Mexico in the mountains of Mexico, and I'll never forget, we, we left uh, the city of Durango, Mexico to go up in the mountains several hours away, and we were there for four days, and we did not take a shower, we did not change clothes, we did not wash our hands. And we ate with filthy hands, all right? So now, um, I, we, we went to a restaurant. I'll never forget this. We went into a restaurant in this village, and uh, they had a special for chicken, all right? And we discovered where the chicken was coming from because as we walked in, tied to the legs of one of the tables was the chicken they were getting ready to serve. <laughs> now... The story in Mark 7 is that Pharisees accused Jesus of sinning because he didn't wash his hands before he ate. Now, what had happened was the uh, Pharisees had become so traditional that they began to conflate some of their traditions with what the Bible actually taught that they were to do. And so they began to say, if you did not wash your hands, it was a sin to do that and then to eat without having washed your hands. And Jesus addressed that, okay? And then the second story is about, I call this uh, mama-daughter problems. There was a mother that had a daughter that was demon-possessed. Now, if you've ever had a teenage daughter, you might have thought she was demon-possessed, all right? <laughs> I'll have to be honest, okay? When I was... Uh, having teenage daughters of my own, okay, two, I was never more confused than I was when I had two teenage daughters living in my home. I had no clue what to expect. At one moment, everything was great. At the next moment, I thought they were demon-possessed, all right? So <laughs> I had no clue how to react. But this woman actually did have a daughter that was demon-possessed. And she came to Jesus... And she said, Lord, I want you to heal my daughter. And Jesus said something to her that was, to be honest, it probably would have offended most of us. We would have thought he's being rude. Beyond rude, it was just unbelievable what he said. This woman said, Lord, I want you to heal my daughter. Now, she was not a Jewish person, okay? She was a Gentile. And Jesus said to her, this is what he said, it's not right to take the children's food and feed it to dogs. Now, anybody would have been offended by that? You felt like Jesus was calling you a dog? You're not even worth 
uh, my time. You're not even worth uh, you know, a meal. Man, that sounded offensive. But Jesus did it on purpose for a reason. He wasn't being rude. And this woman, here's what she said. This showed her faith. She said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table get to eat some of the crumbs from the children. And I love what it says in the translation I'm reading today. Jesus said, good answer. Good answer. And it demonstrated her faith. Demonstrated that when we are in need and when we know that God needs to work, that we have faith. That we trust God, that He and He alone can do it. Well, the third story is about Jesus healing a deaf and a mute man, but I won't read that part or, or the entire chapter. But I do want to read several passages from Mark chapter 7 and give you three thoughts about the heart behind serving. What is the heart? What do you do? How do you step up? How do you get involved? Let's begin reading in verse number 14. Mark 7. And then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. Now remember, he's talking, he's responding to these Pharisees that were like, oh my goodness, he ate without washing his hands. He is a wicked, wicked person. Jesus is correcting them. He's saying, it's not what goes into the body, but rather it's what comes from the heart that defiles a man. So here's the first thought. Serving begins in the heart. Like most things, serving begins in the heart. Now, Jesus wants you to have a heart behind your serving. Now, I, I want to give you just a couple of thoughts on this. Before you can serve the Lord, you must receive Christ. You see, there are some people that think that just good deeds in and of themselves are what earns you favor with God, that what, that's what gets you into heaven. And that's simply not true. In fact, it couldn't be further from the truth. The Bible is very clear that our sin, our righteousness, never measures up to the level of being able to earn one moment of heaven. It never measures up to the level of being made right with God. Now, is it good to do good things? Well, sure but not to depend on that for your salvation, not to depend on that for your relationship with God. Where good deeds are effective is when they come from the heart. And they must come from a heart that has been saved, that has been born again, that has turned to Jesus. And when a good deed, when something that is you're, you're giving to God, you're serving, you're getting involved, you're getting plugged in, when that comes from a redeemed heart, from a heart that has been saved and changed, then you've got something. Because you're not serving to earn God's favor. You're not serving to earn God's blessing, but you're serving because of it. You're serving because you love Him. It comes from the heart. Now, once again, in Jewish thought, the heart was the seat of the mind, of the thinking, of the decision-making, of the will. Now, it's interesting that Jesus also in Mark chapter 12 told us how we are to love God. He said this, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart. Once again, we think emotions, but that's not what he was referring to. Uh, he's talking about your mind, your thoughts, your decisions, in other words, and your soul. Now, your soul did contain your, your emotions, your emotions, your mind, uh, your decisions, uh, that's your soul. And then he says all your mind, and he said your strength. Your strength is your uh, talent, your time, your ability. Now, let, let's look at what he says. Uh, he says that we're to serve God in these ways. In other words, it's to come from our heart. So we're to serve God with our mind and our body. Now, what does that mean, serving God with your body? Well, don't get guilty of thinking too spiritually. I heard one preacher say it this way. Some people are so spiritually minded, they're no earthly good. And, and what we mean by that is this. 
Don't over-spiritualize everything. Sometimes, you know what God wants you to do? He wants you to serve Him with your body, and by doing that, you're just being present. That's the point, that if you're going to serve God, you got to be present. Some people say things like, well, um, my, I'm not with you in body, but I'm with you in spirit. Or our heart is with you. Well, what they're saying is that something or some reason, they just can't be there. And they're, they're trying to give you an emotional support, but it doesn't work. Okay? Look, when a person has a funeral, when they have someone in their family die, um, they don't want to hear that, oh, I'm with you in spirit. Now, sometimes I realize that distance or circumstances keep you from attending a funeral. But listen, you know what they need? They don't need your thoughts. They need your presence. That's what they need. And, and so in the same way, what Jesus is saying, when you love God with your strength, uh, you're, you're going to be present. And when it comes to serving God and uh, being involved and using your talent, you got to be present. That's very important. Uh, you serve God with your emotions. Now, often what we do is we give emotions too much credit. Because in our heart, we feel like we love the Lord. In our heart, we feel like we want to be involved, even if we're not. And, and, and I say that's a good thing to want to be involved, but and it's a good thing to use your emotions because whenever your emotions are involved, it helps connect you. It helps you feel more involved. It helps you feel more apart. So emotions are important. They're part of who God made you to be. But if all you depend on is emotions, then what do you do when you didn't feel it? What do you do on the Sundays that you don't feel like getting out of bed? And I'm not talking about you're sick or out of town. I'm talking about you just feel like laying in bed for a little while. I told my wife, there are times that I just feel like laying in bed, not going to church. She said, you can't do that. You're the pastor. <laughs> so, well, look, you know, what he wants is more than our emotions, okay? Emotions are important. That's part of who you are. It's part of who God made you to be. But he wants us to serve him with our mind, our decisions, he wants to serve him with our emotions, yes, but he also wants us to serve him with our body. So don't try to over-spiritualize things. A lot of times we think that, well, because I've got this emotional connection, that spiritually, me and God, we got it going on, we got it good. But you know what God puts a great emphasis on? Your body. Being there. Being present. Not being an absentee, making sure that you show up. So we're to serve God with our will, our decisions, our spirit. That's the part of you that connects with God. Uh, we're to serve God with our body, with our strength, with our talent, and our time. And our heart must be tender and open to the call of God. Listen to what Jesus said in John 10, 27. My sheep listen to my voice. And I know them and they follow me. And often it is that we don't hear the voice of God because he calls us and he wants us to be present. Then in the next two verses, Mark 7, 6, and 7, uh, Jesus is responding to these guys that accuse him of sinning because he didn't wash his hands according to their Jewish tradition. He said, these people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their heart isn't in it. They act like they're worshiping me, but they don't mean it. They just use me as a cover for teaching whatever suits their fancy, ditching God's command, and taking up the latest fads. Man, isn't that, isn't that convicting? Sometimes we say we have a form of serving God, but our heart's not in it. Oh, we say we love God, but our heart's not in it. Serving begins in the heart. Now, Jesus did say that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay? So the idea is you want your heart to be all in. You want your heart to love God. You want your heart to be at the forefront. What do you do? You act. You decide. You get involved. Because he said, 
when you do something, your heart will follow. And so serving begins in the heart. What does that mean? Well, it means we've got to be willing. God's called every Christian to serve him by serving others. It means we've got to be present. It means we're to serve God with our time and our talent. You see, God did not give you the talent he gave you just to use for you. Your talent, no matter what it is. Maybe you're an artist. Maybe you're a musician. Maybe you're really good at computers. Maybe you're a good business person. Maybe you're good at math. Maybe you're good at helping others. Maybe you're good at cooking. Maybe you're good with kids. It doesn't matter what it is. He's given you a talent not simply to use on your own self, not simply to use for your own life. He's given you a talent to use for him. So he wants us to use our time and our talent. Now, here's the thing. There are a lot of people, they have the talent, but they don't think they have the time. Can I shock you with a fact? Buckle your seatbelt. All right, here we go. We all have exactly the same amount of time every day. Now, I know that may be shocking to you, and I'm not talking about we have the same length of life. I'm saying every person in the room, as long as you live, you have 24 hours every day. Every day. Now, why then do some people not have any time in their minds to serve God? It's because of what they choose to do. Now, and once again, I know that sometimes your job uh, you know, keeps you away at certain times and so on and so forth. I get that, okay? But what I'm talking about is that we all have the ability to serve God. We all have the exact same amount of time. It's just what we choose to do with our time. Uh, we've got to be open to new ways that God can use us. It's interesting that um, Jesus dealt with this group of people. They were very religious, by the way, very moral. In fact, I know I give the Pharisees a hard time a lot of times because they were so self-righteous and so forth. But if you want to talk about good people, people that were moral, people that were upstanding citizens, these people were it. They were the best of the best, morally speaking. Okay? And so um, let's not forget that We've got to put obedience above tradition. It's real easy to get caught up in that, isn't it, when it comes to serving God? Uh, these Pharisees did. They put tradition above obedience. You know what God wants us to do? To put effectiveness and obedience above tradition. Now I realize that some people are like, well, we can't change. We can't change the old ways. Well, I agree with that when it comes to not changing uh, the gospel or not changing what you believe about the Word of God. That's true. We stay committed, okay? But when it comes things to things that are not prescribed in the Bible, like our tradition or our musical style or the way that we do ministry, can I tell you, we've got to be willing to change to be more effective. Let me tell you this. You may not know this. One of the most famous and most traditional Christian songs in history. Every one of you know it. What is it? Amazing Grace. Amazing. It's saying, Grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Did you know, once again, that's one of the most traditional, most sung Christian songs in history, okay? If we would say, uh, if you want to describe something traditional, that old hymn is at the center of what it means to be traditional, right? Okay? But did you know that when that song was written, 
The man that wrote it was wicked, a reprobate, and he got saved. And he wrote about God's amazing grace. But do you know that that song did not become popular? It did not become well known until it was put to a bar tune of that day. You could say that Amazing Grace, when it first came out, was the original contemporary music of its day. Now, once again, um, it's a beautiful song. But, you know, don't think that it's always been well received because when it was put to a bar tune, there were Christians all throughout the world. Oh, my goodness, we can, that's a bar tune. Do you realize we're singing the devil's music? <laughs> you know, and I remember growing up uh, that the music that I liked was called the devil's music because, um, you know, it had a little bit of a rock beat to it, all right? Now, the point is, don't miss this, we cannot be so tied to, to tradition that we forget that God has called us to serve Him and to be effective, to be obedient. And so sometimes God is going to, when you serve, when you get involved, what is He going to do? He's going to make you a little uncomfortable. You're going to have to do something that you've never done before. And that's okay. That will lead us to be more effective. Uh, years ago, um, there was a member of our church. His name was Mauricio. Mauricio. He, he since moved to Alaska. He's no longer a member of our church. But I'll never forget Mauricio. He was one of the most exuberant, outgoing, friendly people I've ever met. And, and I loved what he would do. He was so excited that people came to church. He, would, he started out meeting them at the door. And man, he was so happy to see everybody. He made everybody feel good, okay? And then he couldn't stay at the door, and he had to go into the parking lot. And after a while, he was in the parking lot greeting every car that came in, and everybody, oh, he's so happy. Mauricio was, you asked Mauricio how he was doing. Here's what he said. He, he was uh, Hispanic, and uh, Spanish was his first language. English was his second language. And he said, uh, he said Mauricio, how are you doing? He'd go, blessed, blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, you know. And uh, sorry about the bad accent. All right, so, but um, Mauricio was just exuberant and excited and loved people. And eventually the parking lot couldn't hold him. All right, you know what he did? He moved to the road. That dude would literally stand in the middle of the road, waving at cars as they came by and direct and I'm not making this up, there were several times that people thought he was just directing them like a cop, and they just went right into the church parking lot. Some of them <laughs> actually came into church. And they're like, who is this crazy man out here directing people? But you know what? Mauricio was exuberant. He was excited. You know what he did? He served from his heart. And that's what is necessary if you're going to serve God. You got to serve from your heart. That's where it begins. Number two, um, you only serve when you decide to serve. Now, I want you to think about that. I know that you're probably expecting something profound, and that doesn't sound very profound, but if you think about it, it really is. Do you know when you serve? Not when you have time, not when you have talent, not when everything gets around to it. Not when the next eclipse comes, but rather when you decide to do it. That's when you do it. You begin to serve when you serve. That comes from the heart. Now, in the first service, I, I used these illustrations of a couple of people, and they didn't get mad at me, so I'm going to use them again. Matt Miller is one of our elders. And Matt is... Um, he owns a successful company. He has a wife and two small children. He is extremely busy, is my point. If you own a business or if you have a full-time job and you have kids and a wife and a family, you're busy, okay? I'm going to just go out on a limb and say, you're busy, all right? So Matt's very busy. A number of years ago, he and his wife, Cassie, had a terrible car accident while they were on vacation in Florida. And it really hurt him physically for a long, long time. Now, do you know why Matt 
serves. He is up here every week that he's not out of town. He's up here every week, plays guitar, plays bass. He's just always involved. He meets with our team every Wednesday. This is a business owner. He's not on staff at the church, but he takes time. We do a, a, a phone call every Wednesday. We plan out stuff. He is involved. That's my point. He is involved. You say, well, why is he involved? Is it because he's talented? Well, he is talented, but that's not it. Uh, is it because he loves music? Well, there's no doubt he loves music. He does. He's loved it since he was a kid, but that's not the reason he's involved either. Is it because he's got a lot of free time and he doesn't have anything, have, doesn't have anything else to do? Absolutely not. He's very, very busy like everyone else. So that's not the reason. Does he love the Lord? Well, yeah, he, he does love the Lord. And yes, that's part of the reason why he serves. But let, let, me, let me help you understand this. Do you know why he began serving and why he stands up here every week? Because he decided to. He said, I'm going to get in. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to be a part. I'm going to let God use me. I talked about Rusty, uh, how he got involved. And Rusty, I remember when he first started coming to our church, uh, he was always so excited. Man, he always loved coming up and talking to me after the service and let me know how much he enjoyed the church. And I always appreciated that. And, uh, you know, and we talked to Rusty for, for a while about getting involved, get, getting plugged in. And now he serves back here every week almost in our tech ministry. And you know why? Well, Jose had to train him and he had to go through training. You know why? Was it because he was the world's greatest expert in this field? No. Uh, was it because his wife, Pat, made him do it? No. <laughs> Though she did tell him for a long time he needed to be involved. <laughs> you know why? He decided to. He said yes. And, and, and I want you to hear me. And I know this sounds so simple. But the way you're going to get involved is also exactly the same thing. you got to say yes. That's it. You say, well, I've I got to wait till the kids grow up and till, uh, you know soccer season's over and until you know, the fish aren't biting and until, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, look, I can promise you you can come up with an excuse. And, and once again, I don't want to... Make it sound like that if you work and you can't avoid that, that I'm hammering you. I'm not. But I'm saying the way you get involved is real simple. You say yes. And that's what God wants you to do. 2 Corinthians 8, 12. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what one does not have. You know what's never going to happen? You're never going to stand before God and hear him say, well, I don't know why you didn't sing on the praise team. And you're like, well, God, I couldn't sing. Doesn't matter that you couldn't carry a tune in the bucket. Doesn't matter that your voice hurt my ears even. <laughs> you should have been involved. That's not what's going to happen. Because according to this, God's not going to judge you according to what you don't have. You ever hear people say, boy, if I had her money, boy, I'd give. No, you wouldn't. I mean, the only way you'd give her money is if you took her money, right? So, but the fact is, we all come up with these excuses. Boy, if I could sing like him, I guarantee you I'd get involved. No, you wouldn't. If you're not involved with what you can do now, what makes you think you would be involved with something else? I mean, oh, boy, if I could preach, I'd be up there. No, you wouldn't. You say, why not? Because I'm the pastor here. You're not going to get up here, all right? So, <laughs> But my point is this. You do what you decide to do. And then finally, impact requires faith. Faithfulness and fruitfulness lead to impact. So if you're going to do this, guess what you got to have? you got to have faith. you got to have faith. It begins in the heart. And you have to say, yes, you decide to do it. But if you're going to decide to say yes, guess what you got to do? You got to have faith. Because guess what it takes? It takes risk. I've never done that before. 
Rusty had never done any of the tech stuff that he's doing now until he said yes. And he got trained, and now he's doing a bang-up job, right? I mean, you never played in church until you did it the first time. You never sang in front of a crowd until you did it for the first time. Remember how nervous you were? Guess what happens, no matter what it is. You never served in children's ministry until you did it for the first time. You say, what happened? You had to have faith. You had to trust God that you weren't going to blow the world up, right? That when you sang for the first time, that people were not going to stone you uh, because it sounded so bad. You had to trust, you had to have faith that God was going to use it. And when, so- when you did that for the first time, you served the first time and somebody came up to you and said, thank you. Thank you for helping my little girl. Thank you for helping my little boy. Thank you for making them learn about Jesus. It built you up. It filled you with faith. It filled you with more faith. And you were glad that you took that step. Why? It took faith before you could be effective. Can I tell you this? It's easy. Easy. To get stale. Even those of us that get involved, you know, sometimes we get weary, we get our focus off of Jesus, we look at the problems, we look at our circumstances, we look at the world, we look at politics, whatever, we look at the news and we get depressed. You know what? You got faith. And God has called you, and it begins in the heart, and it gets activated when you say yes, you make a decision, And then you trust God. You trust God. Now, you should prepare. Got to warn you, if you're going to try out for the worship team, you got to be able to sing. And not only that, there are some people that can sing, but they don't have the commitment. You know what you've got to do when you sing up here and play up here? You got to memorize it. Isn't that crazy? You say, well, man, that's a lot. Yeah, it is. Because it's important. Okay? And the same way, You don't get involved unless you make a commitment. And you don't become effective unless you commit to it. Because guess what? Worshiping God, God deserves our best. He deserves our best. Serving kids, you know what they deserve? They don't deserve leftovers. They don't deserve half-hearted effort. I mean... What if you threw a birthday party for your four-year-old and you hired a clown? I guess they still do that, right? You hired a clown, all right? You know, I mean, it's so advanced nowadays. It's like, uh, you mean you didn't rent out Disney World for your four-year-old, you know? Uh, But you hired a clown and that clown showed up, didn't have his nose on right, didn't have his uh, makeup on right, didn't get out of a clown car or 42 other clowns, you know? I mean, he just gave a half-hearted effort. He showed up, and he was drunk, and you were like, what in the world is going on here? Well, you wouldn't like that. You know why? Because that's a half-hearted effort. In the same way, you know what God wants? You know what he expects? Do you know what he deserves? Our best. He said, well, I'm not very good. You can still give your best. You may never sing, but man, you can do something. You can do something to the very best of your ability and you can make a difference and God will be pleased. And so that is, I believe, where it begins. It begins with heart. With heart. Now today, maybe you need to receive Christ. I want to just challenge you today, if you're watching online or if you're in the room today, and you want to receive Jesus Pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you're resurrected from the grave because you died on the cross for my sin. And I'm turning my life to you. I'm repenting. I'm agreeing with you. I'm changing my mind. I'm asking you to save me. Thank you for hearing me. And thank you for saving me. If you'll pray that prayer, if you'll ask Christ to come into your life, he will. He promised. He will. And if you did that, then take your next step card. And uh, let me talk about the next step card. Uh, Everybody grab those, if you will. There's some sitting there. Everybody grab one where you can see it. Now, there's a few things I want you to do. 
uh, we're going, I want you to get ready. We're going to have the offering in just a moment. But here's what we want you to do with the card. If you're new, fill it out, drop it in the card, in the bucket. Uh, if you pray for salvation today, check that. All right, put that on there. If you want to join the church, this is important because a lot of people are getting out of the habit of, you know, committing to the church. And we have a, a, a next step class every month, but sometimes some people aren't here. And so I want to start making this a more central part of what we do. Maybe you'd say, I need to join the church. I need to be a part. I need to take my next step. Put that on there. Check that, okay? Do that today if you've not done it. Maybe you have a prayer request. Or you want to be involved in serve your neighbor that's coming up where we're giving away the free barbecue. Just put serve your neighbor. We'll know what that means. Um, and then if you want to sign up to serve on the worship team. We're talking about the worship team today. We're celebrating them so if you say, well, you know, I can sing, then, and, and by the way, really be able to sing before you sign up, all right, because, you know, I realize we live in the culture that uh, I, I don't, I've never really watched American Idol. I don't even know if it's still on television or not, the, but I did watch, and this shows the wickedness of my heart, um, I did watch it when people that were trying out were awful, all right? I just got so much joy out of that, that, watching these people have their dreams crushed. You know, it's like, you know, well, my mom always told me I was a good singer. And they sounded like uh, two billy goats bleeding, you know. And I'm like, oh, good night. I, I don't know why I got joy out of that, but I did. And I apologize for that. I know that shows how bad I am. All right, so, but if you have only been told ever by your mother that you can sing, please do not put your name on that card, okay? Because I've got bad news for you. You can't sing, all right? Now, if your mother, now, if somebody else has told you you're good, then yeah, go ahead and risk it, okay? But if your mother's the only one that's ever told you you can sing, I've got bad news for you. You cannot carry a tune in a bucket, all right? So save yourself the embarrassment. But Anyway, if you'd like to sign up for that or try out, you play an instrument. And once again, the instruments we use here on the stage, now you might be able to play um, the spoons, okay? And maybe you're the best spoon player in the country. I don't know if we got a spot for you. I mean, I'll let Chip make that decision, okay? So there we go, all right? So we'll call it percussion, all right? There we go, we'll call it percussion. And uh, so... But whatever it is, okay, uh, if you'd like to be involved in that, then you can drop that in the offering when it passes. That, have you had enough time now to put your name down? Okay. Ushers, would you come and let's pass the buckets, and you can drop your next step card in. Also, if you have an offering, you can drop that in at this time as well. Let me tell you how you can give. You can give in this offering, and if it passed you before you were able to uh, put your offering in, there's a drop box on the way out, your right, on your right as you walk out, uh, you can drop it in there. Um, but here's the other ways you can give. You can give by text. You can text the number 84321, or you can give online at uh, stillwaters.online, or you can use the mobile app uh, that is on your phone, and uh, that's the way probably the majority of our giving comes in now. 95 to 97 percent of our giving typically now comes in digitally, and so. Um, but if you're the one that's like, no, I like to actually put it in the offering plate, then uh, you can do that as well. All right, and I encourage you to give. Be faithful. We've got a lot of things coming up. Um, we are. I've got some news to give you here soon uh, about where we are with closing on this building. Got some information um, that we'll go into. And uh, but so we need you is my point, not just because of this building, but it's because of reaching people. And we can't do what we do without you, without your involvement. And so maybe you're one that you used to give, but you've kind of slacked off. I want to encourage you. Not for me. It's not for me. It's for the Lord. It's for the cause of Christ. Give, give, be faithful. Maybe you've never been faithful to give. We'll start. Test God. You know, it's the only thing he said, Try me in this and see if I want. Open the windows of heaven. Pour out a blessing so great that you won't be able to receive it. 
And so, um, you know, start where you are. Start somewhere. If you're not faithful uh, in giving, you got to start to begin with. You got to say yes. Got to make a decision. And then maybe you're not one that says, you know what, I'm going to start out with a full tithe. And you're like, well, I don't have the faith to do that. Well, start somewhere. All right, start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. So uh, be a um, be a percentage giver, if you will. Uh, start somewhere, and then be a progressive giver. Grow in your giving. Over the years, uh, Kim and I have been able to grow in our faith and grow in our giving. There have been years. There have been some years because of how God blessed me in a particular thing. And I'm talking about my salary, not the gross income or whatever. But there have been years that I've given almost the equivalent of almost 100% of my salary. You say, how in the world did you do that? It was a God thing, okay? And I don't do that all the time. Uh, but there have been times. What is my point? Be a progressive giver. Grow in your giving. God might lead you to do something he's not leading anybody else to do. He, he leads everyone to give, okay? Everyone. Because it's a part of generosity. It's a part of being thankful. It's a part of growing. But uh, there may be some of you that God uses to start a business. And you're going to be like a businessman that I knew growing up. He made a commitment to give 10% not off of his profit, but off of his gross income. Before he paid salaries, before he paid the power bill, before he paid expenses, and people were like, you're crazy. There's no way that will work. That business model will destroy you. But God led him to do it, and he only became one of the wealthiest men in South Carolina. I remember going to his house and seeing his Rolls Royce in his garage. And, and once again, this was a guy that gave more than anybody that I knew. So it wasn't because he was selfish or hoarding or any of that kind of stuff. You know what he said? You can't outgive God. And when you obey, and I'm not saying God calls everyone to do that, okay? But I'm simply saying God calls everyone to tithe. But, he, but maybe he speaks to you about something. Maybe your faith needs to grow. Maybe you need to take a risk. And God's going to bless you. Wouldn't it be great if God used you to start a business or to own a business where you made an impact on the kingdom of God? Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be a legacy to leave behind? Well, I hope maybe God will be able to use you to do that uh, one day. But don't forget, next Sunday, 11 o'clock, we have our cookout afterwards. We're baptizing. We're going to recognize our youth next week uh, and the people involved in that. We've got a lot of teenagers that serve, and uh, we're going to recognize some of them. These are some of the greatest kids in the world, the greatest people in the world. I love these kids, and uh, it's awesome. Uh, to have them involved in our church. All right? All right. I need to quit running my mouth. Everyone stand. God bless you. Thank you. I love you. We'll see you next Sunday.